Good evening, everybody, and thank you for this uh, opportunity to make this presentation. Um, I hope, uh, from my end, that it will incite a, a, an interesting discussion at the end, because uh, for me, at least, this is definitely a uh, work in progress with a lot to think about and a lot to plan for in the future. Since it's a relatively small group, I wanted to start with a couple of questions uh, to the audience and then revisit these questions at the end of the talk. So the first question, and if you guys maybe can just uh, throw out some uh, comments or, or numbers, how, how would you rate, knowing what you know right now, Armenia's healthcare system? Let's say below average, average, above average, or exceptional? Uh, average. 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 Average to below average. What are the main problems with healthcare in Armenia? Medical uh, women's and children's issues. Med so. Medical supplies. Medical supplies and issues related to it. What public else? Health. What's that? Public health. Pub public health issues. Insurance. Okay, insurance or globally access to care. Okay. Lack of postgraduate training. Education. Okay, good. How effective has the diaspora been with helping to improve health care in Armenia? So again, not too effective, effective, or very effective. Not too effective. So the whole gamut. So some with not and some with very effective. And we'll save that last question for after the talk. So I'm a pediatric surgeon. It's a very specialized field in medicine. Um, how does that, how can, how can I reconcile that ultra specialized clinical field that I have with a global question like what is the state of healthcare in Armenia? And uh, the person that I learned most about how to think about healthcare in Armenia was an Armenian patient of mine uh, during my first month when I was doing fellowship in, in Toronto. So he was a four-year-old named Armen. And when I met him, he had stage four neuroblastoma. And overall, the survival from this condition is less than 5%, one year survival. But he was he presented to the hospital and he had gotten chemotherapy and radiation before I had met him. And at that time, when I met him, it was time for him to undergo his operation. He had a big abdominal tumor that needed to be removed. And when we met him, when we saw him in clinic, uh, in talking to his parents, I realized that what most people think about surgery, including his parents, was that, okay, he's gonna go to the operating room, the surgeon's gonna take out the tumor, and he's gonna leave the operating room without the tumor, and everything is gonna be well. But really what happens in the operating room with what's going on in my mind, and what most people don't know, is that the operating room is a place where a very sophisticated process happens, very well-planned, coordinated event. There are multiple layers of safety and security. Everybody has a very well-defined role as to what they need to do. And it's not just about the surgeon. There's a whole team approach to taking care of the patient when they're in the operating room. And how does that all come together? It all comes together before the patient comes into the operating room, when all of us get together and do what's called a timeout, which is mandatory before we do any surgery. So coming back to uh, Armen, he did undergo a successful resection of his tumor. That was followed by a bone marrow transplantation. He continues to be followed, uh, and when I left about a year ago, he was tumor-free and has an expected five-year survival of over 50%. So what's happened between in the last two decades that has changed the survival from this condition from 5% to 50%? So there's obviously been a lot of increases in the level of knowledge, what we know about this disease, the technology used to take care of it, autologist bone marrow transplantation, for example, the resources that the healthcare systems have to take care of it, the fact that we as physicians know how to collaborate better between oncologists, radiation oncologists, etc., the lessons we've learned in the past, and all of these safety and uh, process sort of mechanisms that we now have in place, such as the timeout. So for me, what was the lesson from Armin that I learned? I started to think about healthcare in Armenia, much like I thought about my patients in the hospital. And when I look at healthcare in Armenia, I consider it, I think that it's in pretty serious condition, much like that patient, with an uncertain prognosis. I don't know if any of us know which way it'll go towards the better, towards the worse, but there's an opportunity to improve the situation. And much like there's a lot of things that have changed with regards to medicine in the past 20 years, a lot has changed in the realities of Armenia in the past 20 years that I think give us an opportunity to do a better job in Armenia. 
So we're past the humanitarian crises of the earthquake and the war. We do have some sort of infrastructure we can work with. We have the resources of the diaspora, and now we have 20 years of experience that we can learn from. So I think that for all people who are involved or are interested in improving healthcare in Armenia, we should all collectively be doing a timeout. And much like this checklist that we have to go through before we operate on any patient in the operating room, we should do three things. We should first and foremost introduce ourselves. Who are the people who are the stakeholders in healthcare in Armenia? Much like we have to introduce the nurse and the doctor and the anesthesiologist in the operating room. Most importantly, what is the problem? Why is the patient in the operating room? Are we going to be doing the right surgery for this patient? Are we, by doing intervention X as a diaspora, doing the right thing for healthcare in Armenia? And finally, we should assess ourselves. Before the patient leaves the operating room, we have to debrief and say, how could we do this operation better next time? So using this timeout model, if we can think about healthcare in Armenia, what is the problem? The fundamental problem starts with the fact that the constitution of Armenia requires that everyone have the right to basic medical services free of charge. And this is corroborated by most international organizations that believe that healthcare is a fundamental human right. But on the flip side, healthcare is an extremely expensive commodity, and no country in the world, much less Armenia, a developing country, can provide for all of the healthcare needs of all of its citizens. Furthermore, Armenia has the legacy of the Soviet healthcare system with a lot of built-in inefficiencies, with a highly centralized system, too many specialists, not enough primary care uh, uh, physicians, and a culture of informal payments and other practices that uh, many of you alluded to uh, a few minutes ago. So that's sort of the 20,000 foot view. What about bringing it down to more basic stuff, the 10,000 foot view? When we look at improving healthcare, I think it should, things should be focused on three things. Maximizing access so that mo the most amount of people can have uh, access to healthcare. Minimizing or optimizing the costs of providing this healthcare so that it could be as affordable as possible. And finally, in maximizing the quality of the services that are given to the patients. So how do we take this back down to an even more palatable sort of uh, uh, level? Well, I think when we think about it, we have to approach each and every sort of uh, aspect that goes into a healthcare system, including healthcare policy, healthcare resources, the financing of, of the healthcare system, medical education, as we talked about, and finally, in our unique situation, our Armenia situation, the role of the diaspora. So I'll go over each of these uh, one by one just to give an overall view, and then hopefully we can have a di dialogue about what we in the diaspora should be doing. So what's going on with healthcare policy in Armenia? Well, since independence, there has been a lot of reforms to healthcare policy. There has been some optimization and the reduction of a lot of the unused capacity that was again left from the Soviet times. There's been privatization of healthcare institutions, which in theory should be a positive development, but the way things have been privatized and how that, that has gone forward actually muddies that water as well. There's been some decentralization, which again, in theory, should be positive. And there's been some little focus on health, uh, basic healthcare needs, uh, including an emphasis on obstetric abstract, care, development of a primary care program, more allocation to the regions outside of the capital, and some innovative policy uh, 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 measures, such as the introduction of the mandatory seal belt enforcements. But objectively looking, here's a, a study that came out of uh, Europe that looked that did a comparative analysis of health policy performances of 43 European countries. And European is used very loosely here. In fact, it includes all of the countries that are in the region uh, or the same situation as Armenia. And they assessed each country on these 10 very important, I think all of us would agree, health policy markers, including policy as it pertains to tobacco, alcohol, uh, nutritional, undernutrition, malnutrition issues, etc., etc., as you can see here. And this is how Armenia performed. So we're unfortunately third from the bottom in terms of how well we do in terms of health policy performance. And there's a lot of ways that you can look at this data. And, and when I initially sort of presented this data, people said, well, that's not really true of reflective of how well our policymakers do. It's actually a marker of uh, the socioeconomic situation in the country. but. Even if you look at the data broken down with that, and if you compare countries and their gross domestic product, 
countries who actually are poorer or have a lower gross domestic product still do better in terms of their healthcare policy than Armenia does. And there's another argument, well, this is just a byproduct of the corruption or the inequalities in the country, but even that doesn't pan out. When you look at the, uh, an index or the Gini coefficient, which measures inequality in a, in a population, there are countries that are much more unequal uh, than Armenia, who still, again, do better in, their, in terms of their healthcare policies. So without going into details of all these problems, there's major huge deficiencies that remain in the policy realm as, as it pertains to licensing of uh, physicians, regulation of the healthcare industry, the, reform, the transparency in the reform process, like the privatization process, the essentially absence of any role of civil society in healthcare in Armenia, still a, 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 a deficit of focus on base, basic healthcare determinants, and there's still a lot of overutilization uh, over and, and, and malallocation uh, of resources in the country, et cetera, et cetera. But what about uh, healthcare financing, the positive? So there's been an increase in uh, healthcare spending since uh, uh, 2000 over the past decade. Increase in primary healthcare spending has more than doubled on paper. And there's been introduction of innovative ideas like the basic healthcare services package and the maternity vouchers, which uh, in theory should provide all of uh, uh, maternal uh, obstetric care free of charge in Armenia. But this is data from the Armenian government itself, not even from an outside institution. The 2006 Armenian Household Health Expenditure Study concluded that formal and informal payments from the patient, so out-of-pocket payments, were substantially more than the total amount of public health care savings, so the public's contribution to health care was much less than the patients or the individual citizens. And this number, more, more uh, concerning, is a very regressive number. So the richest population in Armenia paid only 5.2% of their income on health care costs. And the poorest population, poorest citizens, the ones that can't even afford health care, ended up spending more than a quarter of their income on their health care needs. Over 25%, or approximately 25% of Armenian households reported incurring a catastrophic health care expenditure over the past two years at the time that this study was done. Armenia spends 1.6% of its budget uh, on, uh, on health care, whereas developing countries spend more than 6%. And because of this, health care in most former Soviet republics is more affordable than it is in Armenia. So there's a comparison of how different countries uh, in the region uh, uh, contribute to healthcare spendings as a country. Countries in green are, are countries that spend more than 3% of their uh, uh, GDP on healthcare. The ones in yellow are uh, those that spend 2 to 3, which is sort of borderline, and, and Armenia, one of the few countries that spends less than 2% of their income on healthcare, uh, of, the, of the national budget on healthcare. And the 2% mark is important because the World Health Organization has designated 2% as a threshold for it to consider any country as, being, as making an effort to address the health of their population, and unfortunately Armenia is not reaching that threshold. In fact, I would say that that threshold is designed for countries, other countries who have younger populations and more optimized resources, whereas in Armenia we have uh, uh, much more physicians than uh, our neighbors and much more hospital beds which means that we have high costs and low public spending, and the results are numbers like this. The overall wage of an average worker in Armenia, be that uh, a driver, an uh, engineer, whatever, it is $300 a month. These are formal numbers, obviously. They don't reflect, reflect the actual income of physicians. But formally, the average wage compared of the healthcare worker is only $200 a month for physicians and $150 for <coughs> nurses. And this number, according to uh, 2006 numbers, is only 1.3 times the minimal consumer basket, a number, a, a number that someone would need to bring in to just bring in enough money to get calories into their family on a, on a monthly basis. Nevertheless, there are some improvements in the financing uh, mechanism that have been proposed and some have been implemented, including an increase in the medium-term expenditure framework. This was from the prior uh, prime minister. Um, development of the so social safety nets and the introduction of the maternity vouchers. What about medical education? So some development since the uh, uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, there has been a reduction of medical graduates, uh, which uh, is a positive development. However, this is countered. This is all unfortunately public 
medical education, countered by the blossoming and the explosion of private medical schools, so even this number doesn't really stand anymore. The introduction of the English curriculum, the revision of the medical education curriculum to uh, align with international standards, introduction of primary health care training, and there was an, an attempt to license physicians, but that is not actually being practiced right now. But in terms of problems, there's, absolutely, there's very little control of quantity of medical graduates, uh, lack of accreditation, lack of an updated curriculum. Uh, there's no regulation in the number of uh, residency positions. So if one year everybody wants to be a nephrologist, then the country could potentially not have any cardiologists or vice versa. Uh, there's no control or experience of the training of the residents. So interestingly, the way you graduate, this is a little bit of a blanket statement, but Residency in Armenia is you do the defined period of time and then you sit in front of professors and you take your oral exam. And if you're a surgeon, you could do your five years, but you could, in that five years, never had seen many of the cases that are considered to be bread and butter surgical cases. And the absence of licensing and continuing medical education requirements, that's something that is currently being worked on. And what kind of results do we get here? Unfortunately, I'm sorry, this is in small type. This is a, a, a friend of mine who's a pediatric emergency physician from the East Coast who did a study of uh, uh, pediatric, or sorry, emergency physicians in Yerevan and their knowledge of basic pediatric resuscitation. So basic stuff, the number of chest compressions to breath sifts if a, if a baby is not breathing and et cetera. And uh, she did a survey of the pediatric emergency physicians and. Uh, and developed a 10, 10 question simple survey. And uh, from that survey, 89.7% of the par participants were not able to pass this 10 question survey on, on basic pediatric resuscitation. And the population was emergency physicians, ambulance physicians. What about the quality of healthcare in Armenia? So this would take a whole <laughs> dissertation to do, and it would be impossible to do in a, in a one hour long talk. There is a relatively good so sort of synopsis of this in a, uh, a policy paper that was uh, published by the Hurai Marukyan Foundation in 2011 titled Social Reforms in Armenia. And I just want to paraphrase a few words from them. They, they concluded that the mechanisms for quality medical care are still in a very fragmentary nature in Armenia. There's little motivation for any medical workers to introduce or act on continuous quality improvement measures. In fact, there are obstacles to the improvement of the situation with inadequate requirements for uh, CME, continuing medical education, licensing, absence of an accreditation system, and just an overall low level of competition between medical establishments. And their conclusion was that in general, the systematic approach is aimed at improving the level of quality medical care cannot be considered adequate in Armenia. So a lot of us, including myself, are clinicians or, or scientifically oriented people and all of that may be a little abstract. How do we put this in numbers? And so we'll look at some of the outcomes or the, or the, or the uh, data that comes out of Armenia. So here's the life expectancy in Armenia. Started off at the collapse of the Soviet Union right around 68 years of age uh, and has gone up, but just by a little over the past two decades. If you were to stack up all the countries in the world, that's the bottom part of this slide. Uh, based on their wealth, and then uh, looked at their life expectancy. The orange bar is Armenia. And this, to me, is, uh, is uh, an inspiring diagram for the following reason. I think if you looked at Armenia objectively, where it is in terms of its uh, uh, resources, uh, in terms of the fact that it, it just is uh, leaving a uh, socialist uh, or, or the Soviet Union after seven years of Soviet rule, if you look at things objectively, it's probably where it needs to be in terms of a marker like life expectancy. But what bothers me about this slide is that what we have as a nation is a powerful resource, the diaspora. And for me, it's unacceptable to be happy with just the status quo or be happy with where we are given the resources because we're, we're basically belittling ourselves by saying that the, recent, the diaspora is completely powerless or the intellect of the, our, our colleagues in Armenia is not adequate to bring it up to a level that is above the average or above where it needs to be. In fact, even when you look at the data uh, at a little bit more of a detail, you, you recognize that maybe that life expectancy that we're talking about, which is reported by the National Statistics Service of 73 years, is not accurate if you compare it to international data such as the World Health Organization, which uh, which estimates the life expectancy at 68 years. And notice the big discrepancy here between expect life expectancy between males and females. 
What's even worse is when you look at the data and you nitpick even more is the health of the citizens and the society of Armenia. Whereas in our regional uh, neighbors, so the, the dark blue graph on this chart is how many years of life are lived. The light blue is how many years of life are lived in health. And when you look at our averages for our region, their healthy life expectancy is about 60 years and uh, overall life expectancy is about 69 years. So nine years essentially of life are lived in disability or illness. And then you compare that to Armenia where the difference between living healthy and living altogether is over a decade. So nearly 12 years of life are lived in disability, in illness, unable to contribute to society, and an overall burden on the healthcare system in Armenia. There's a big issue with human resource surplus and maldistribution of healthcare in Armenia. We have more physicians uh, per population than the European averages, not enough nurses compared to European averages, and when you nitpick the data again, you notice that in places like the capital, we have twice as many physicians per capita than in Europe, and in the regions, we have less than half the physicians that probably need to be out there. And again, you would think, so we have these physicians, we have these hospital beds, maybe we should be using them. We also have a, an aging population, with 30% of the population of Armenia being over 60 years of age, but we don't even utilize this. When you look at hospital admissions compared to other countries, Armenia actually has a very low utilization of hospital beds and admissions. What about our commitments to international, uh, international goals and international standards? So uh, over the past decade, there's been the development of the Millennium Development Goals. These were eight international development goals set by the United Nations, four of which had to do with medical or healthcare issues. How has Armenia performed on that? So Millennium Development Goal number one uh, had uh, uh, markers which looked at uh, malnutrition and undernutrition. So the important uh, numbers are the ones that are circled here. The uh, target values are the ones on the right and where we are in Armenia. Uh, projected to be in 2015, the final numbers have not been released yet. But you can see that we did not reach our targets for malnutrition and undernutrition in children under five years of age in Armenia, whereas other countries, and I'll show you the data later, who are much poorer than Armenia or in Sub-Saharan Africa, etc., actually reached their Millennium Development Goals, and we did not. Same thing with child mortality, so under 5 mortality rate, infant mortality rate did not reach their target levels uh, by 2000, or were not projected to reach their target levels in 2015. And unfortunately, the data uh, is the same for maternal mortality, with Armenia not reaching its target levels by 2015 for maternal mortality rate. In fact, the only Millennium Development Goal as it pertains to healthcare uh, that Armenia did reach was Millennium Development Goal number six, which had to do with uh, combating infectious diseases. So where, is the, uh, where, where does the burden of disease lie in Armenia? This is a slide that uh, uh, reviews the major causes of mortality and morbidity in Armenia. The top five causes of mortality being heart disease, stroke, diabetes, lung disease, and then lung cancer. And morbidity may be surprising to some people, uh, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, but neuropsychiatric conditions is also a big uh, uh, contributor to morbidity in Armenia, as are road traffic accidents, so traumatic injuries. Uh, if we want to address those mortality and mor morbidity issues, I think what, one place to start is by looking at the risk factors that contribute to these, uh, to these diseases and processes in Armenia. As you can see here, there's a very high, and not surprising to many of us who have been to Armenia, very high prevalence of uh, risk factors such as obesity, tobacco use, physical inactivity, high blood pressure, and alcohol users. And these aren't just absolute numbers. Even when you compare it to our regional averages, Armenians on average have higher blood glucose levels, higher blood pressure levels, more obesity in females, and more tobacco use in males compared to our regional averages. We're not trying to compare ourselves to Europe or America over here. But what we also have, and I think this is another sort of very important slide and something to keep in mind, is a population that is very educated and very aware of their risk factors. And when we start thinking about how we address these risk factors uh, and how sensitive public health interventions can be, the education level and the awareness level of the po target population is a very good prognostic factor as to if we were to design appropriate interventions and implement it in a country like Armenia where most people are aware of the bad influences of their risk factors 
and then also implement it in a country where the awareness is not as high that the outcomes are going to be much, much better in Armenia. What about preventative health in Armenia? So another, another striking uh, uh, statistic here, and I apologize, it doesn't project well, but in terms of women's health, 83% of women report not having undergone a mammogram, and 90% of women report not having undergone, uh, excuse me, 83% not a pap smear, 90% not a mammogram in Armenia. And again, we're not comparing ourselves to the 90 plus compliance uh, that you would get in Europe and, uh, and, and uh, North America, even when we compare ourselves to other former Soviet republics, which are the uh, darker red over here, you can see Armenia doesn't perform as well as our uh, neighboring countries. And obviously, what kind of data does this, uh, does this lead to? Here's, a, 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 again, data from the National Oncology Center itself showing the five-year survival after the diagnosis of breast cancer in Armenia being 47%, so 50% of women in Armenia diagnosed with breast cancer die, which is, if you think about how easy it is to screen for and treat early breast cancer, a very staggering number. In fact, in Armenia in 2008, 40% of patients who presented, the first time they presented with their cancer, they were already in stage four disease. That means there was no interventions on the screening level, on the risk factor reduction level, and these patients are essentially uncurable by the time they present to hospital. So what I hope I could have done by presenting that data is, um, is uh, debunk the myth that maybe doesn't, uh, uh, maybe isn't as prevalent in this group as it is in what I feel in the overall diaspora and that the problems with healthcare in Armenia have much, have it's much more than the common perceptions that many of us have that, oh, the hospitals are old and the doctors take bribes and we don't have enough CAT scan machines in Armenia. In fact, the root causes of the problems with the healthcare system have much more to do with the policy uh, uh, measures, reforms, or lack thereof, the financing of the healthcare system, the medical education system, and etc. So moving on in that timeout model, what about the team members? Who are the people who are invested or stakeholders with uh, uh, healthcare in Armenia? So obviously there's Armenia itself uh, and then the diaspora, but also the global health community, which I think uh, we as a diaspora or Armenia in general has not done a good job of engaging in all sorts of resources in the uh, global health community, whether it be other countries, the private sector, NGOs, civil society, that, the, that we, as Armenians, uh, either here or in Armenia, can, can tap into, and, and the list of these organizations and communities can, can go on. Uh, but I wanted to spend the rest of the talk talking about the diaspora and the role, and what our role can be and should be in Armenia. So, in general, the di uh, Armenian diaspora is one of the largest, uh, most active, most powerful diasporas in the world. We, I, I think everybody would agree, had done, uh, have done a good job with uh, humanitarian relief and aid that was much needed at the collapse of the so uh, Soviet Union. And uh, more recently, I think the diaspora has matured and we've been able to provide some sort of checks and balances with the Republic of Armenia and its officials and etc. But with regards to healthcare, I would say that um, the interventions that the diaspora has done in Armenia have placed less emphasis on long-term sustainable projects. And again, this is in general, and there are a lot of exceptions to this rule. Uh, we've done little in the way of needs assessments uh, and evidence-based practices before going out, asking whether we need to go out and what we need to do. Um, I think that we have not collaborated well, uh, or as well as we should, with local institutions. We, uh, there's still room for improvement in terms of reaching out to the outside global health community. And we haven't been able to assess ourselves in feedback and learn from our lessons, I think, as well as we have. And rather than just throwing out those thoughts out there, I thought I would try to be as evidence-based as possible. And one of the things that I did was uh, uh, try to objectivize the diaspora's contributions to healthcare in Armenia by performing a PubMed search, that's the database of medical literature that, that we use in clinical practice, and uh, look at articles that are, uh, that are published in reference to Armenia over the past 10 years. And in that process, I found uh, 2,000 articles in the past 10 years that refer to Armenia, of which 1,000 were in English. In the excuse me, past five years, there were only 400 of them. And 44 pertain to healthcare public health issues, healthcare issues, healthcare system issues, of which 10 were written or had contributors from the diaspora. So the 
biggest diaspora in the world, or one of the biggest diasporas of the world, 20 years of experience, a lot of healthcare professionals, and not a lot of publications, not a lot of feedback, not a lot of evaluation and results in the, in the community. And, and just in comparison to a country, and I decided to compare this to another country as, uh, again, just a comparison, to, to a country in Sub-Saharan Africa, Mozambique, with virtually no diaspora resources. And in just the past six months, they've published 59 similar articles on how to improve their healthcare system, on the results of interventions, on, on ways to reduce maternal mortality and infant mortality, and all this kind of stuff. And, I, and in my opinion, I think we're, we're lagging uh, significantly with regards to diaspora's con contributions. What about looking at some of the bigger organizations that have done work in, in healthcare in Armenia? So one of the premier uh, uh, organizations of the uh, Armenian diaspora is the Hayasan All Armenia Fund. So the last report that I found online was their two, two, 2011 report. 208 pages, of which four pages were de uh, dedicated to healthcare, and they outlined their four projects. And this is what we as the diaspora have been doing. We've been building complexes, we've been renovating pediatric facilities, we've been making over maternity wards, and we've revamped nephrology departments. And rather than, rather our conclusions at the end of this report be our interventions reduce you know, uh, smoking in Armenia by 1% or increase the rate of mammograms by 5%, we suffice ourselves with conclusions such as the beautifully renovated grounds have a decidedly positive effect on patients and doctors alike. And I would say that that's disappointing to, see, to say the least. So our, our interventions as a diaspora have been a lot of structural interventions, building hospitals, building clinics, painting medical centers and outposts in the villages. And a lot of the clinical work we've done uh, asks, begs a lot of questions. Is it redundant work? And some of it is. A lot of times you go into villages or cities where there's two different diaspora organizations doing the same work on opposite ends of, the, of that town or city. Do they bypass existing capacity? And oftentimes they do. Is it sustainable? And oftentimes it's not. And does it address the burden of the disease in Armenia? And finally, is the work that we're doing in Armenia cost effective? We rely on a lot of donations, on a lot of charitable people to do the work in, in Armenia, and I think it's incumbent upon us to show them that they're getting the most bang for their buck in terms of their donation. And there are very well set standards in the global health literature as to what is cost effective. Interventions that cost less than three times the per capita GDP for each disability adjusted life year averted is, uh, is considered a uh, good value for your money. So are our interventions in Armenia cost effective? I'm not, I'm not sure of many interventions that have actually even assessed their cost effectiveness in Armenia. And we don't have to recreate the wheel, we don't have to do this all by ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that do this. There's an entity within the World Health Organization now called uh, World Health Organization Choice, Choice standing for choosing interventions that are cost effective. They've done this work for us. If we wanted to do as a diaspora region a project that is cost effective, we can look at their regional data database and look at the costs and the impact on that population health and design to do our interventions based on these analyses that they have done. And this is freely available to any one of us uh, who wants to access it. Uh, this is, a, I'll, I'll skip through this slide here. Um, so, the other issue I think uh, that needs to be brought up is that a lot of the diaspora's in interventions is focused on tertiary care, the most advanced care, getting more MRI machines to Armenia and getting more CT scanners to Armenia. And the picture here is a brand new PET scan machine that, would, that is currently being built in Armenia, the first one in the region, and the cause of a lot of uh, celebration and, and pride for many people in Armenia. But, I think we need to ask ourselves, does emphasis on the tertiary care work in a resource poor nation? Is it possible without having the strong foundations of a solid healthcare system? And what are the implications of having all these machines there that now have to be used, that people need to make uh, a business out of or make a profit out of? Are we, can we actually be causing a lot of harm by focusing on the tertiary care rather than focusing on the basic problems of the healthcare, uh, healthcare system. So have we as a diaspora learned our lesson? And I don't know, but I know that people who have looked at us, who are not Armenian, have used 
lessons learned from our example to teach other people, such as this presentation that was given to the Cuban uh, American diaspora, where they, could, where they conclude here and say imbalance, so the underutilization of the potential of the diaspora, and they make the following points, that the imbalance between humanitarian support and investments is a big problem, as is the diaspora support that sometimes becomes a liability and not an asset. And it's interesting to me that other people have learned lessons from our experience, and I'm not quite sure how much we've learned from our uh, uh, experiences. So what, how, can we, how can we propose a solution for this problem? I think conceptually, in my mind, uh, we first need to think about contributing to healthcare in Armenia uh, on a different level. I think that instead of asking ourselves how we can contribute using our own personal expertise, me as a pediatric surgeon, the other person as a cardiologist, how can we go and act as pediatric surgeons in Armenia? I think we need to change that paradigm, and I think all of us, collectively and individually, need to actually ask ourselves whether or not our expertise and skills fit into the overall needs in the country. And if not, how can we adapt our expertise to fit the actual needs in the country? But I recognize that to do that, we need leadership, we need guidance, we need some sort of structure so that we can do that collectively. Um, and in essence, going back to the timeout, I think that we as the diaspora need to develop a new operating room. And rather than working in this operating room where it was only about whether we, we weren't circled around all the resources and had our old ways of doing things, I think we need to think about the problem uh, as being the patient on this operating room table, but bring all of our resources, all these different parts that come into the modern operating room to work on the patient collaboratively, the problem collaboratively in Armenia. So how do we, where, how do we develop this operating room? Is it this organization called AMI, which is Armenian Medical International uh, Congress? Should we be doing it through their uh, world congresses? If so, in fact, there's precedence for this, and I apologize again, I'm probably not going to project well, but this is a uh, itinerary of the fourth global Ethiopian diasporan conference on healthcare and medical education. So again, a less developed diaspora, much smaller diaspora, but if you lead, read their, um, their uh, topics and their people, first of all, this Congress is not only about physicians. There are lawyers, engineers, other, health, other professionals. Kofi Annan was, was a, gave a uh, guest lecture here. And the topics here are uh, uh, tertiary hospitals, what are we doing right and how can the diaspora contribute better, et cetera, et cetera. And they're actually addressing some of these problems that, we, that I've outlined here in my talk. Is it that we have to, do we have to develop this operating room concept through an arc, another organization? Should we leave AMI B with its networking capabilities and, its, and doing what it does and try to come up with another organization? I don't know. Should it be that we should develop a structure in Armenia? And one of the most uh, inspirational experiences for me had been uh, the opportunity and, uh, uh, and the ability to go up and uh, have multiple visits with Dr. Harut Armenian, who's, who's here today, and just sit in his backyard and actually just discuss these things and uh, be able to think out loud and freely and develop these thoughts more and more in my mind. And at one point we were meeting in his backyard and he said something that stuck with me and I think ultimately should and will apply to what we're trying to do with healthcare in Armenia. And he said that the American University of Armenia is the only diaspora-initiated project that actually developed a physical institution, a presence in Armenia. And so the question becomes, should we as AMIC or should we as the healthcare professionals of the diaspora be thinking about or working on a way to develop a, phys a physical presence or an institution in Armenia and work through that institution? So I think we need to ask ourselves, how has the diaspora addressed the problems with healthcare in Armenia? Then, I think, I think we did a good job when it was time to get those dialysis machines to Armenia after the earthquake, when we had that need and we needed the IV tubing and the IV fluids. I think we did a good job, but what about now? Are we doing a good job? And I think I would argue that there now is a big disconnect, that the supply, our diaspora and involvement does not equal the meet the demands or the needs of the country right now. So coming back to our timeouts, we should ask ourselves, what is the problem? Who is the patient? What are the problems with healthcare in Armenia? And are we performing the right operation for that patient right now? Who are the team members? What is everyone's role going to be? And this doesn't apply just to doctors. It doesn't even apply 
just the public health specialists. I think if we are going to organize ourselves and do something collectively, we need to engage other specialties, other experts, and come up with a way to do a better job with contributing to the healthcare system in Armenia. So why now? Why is, why is it, in my mind, right to think about changing the way the diaspora thinks about healthcare contributions in Armenia? Because I think we've gone through that humanitarian crisis period and there's less of a need for us to have our banquets and balls and, and, and raise money to send more medical equipment to Armenia. We also notice that there is a, 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 a very sizable decrease in the interest amongst diaspora and medical societies. The Armenian Society, Medical Society of Los Angeles and Boston and Toronto, etc. If you look at these organizations, they are uh, their attrition rate is is uh, declining significantly, and that's probably a, be a factor or, or, or because of the overall maturation of the diaspora, not just the healthcare communities in that there is now an overall increase in the demand of transparency and accountability in the work that organizations and volunteers do. And it's hard for us to show that the work that we're doing collectively in Armenia is efficient, sustainable, and all the other stuff that we talked about. So I think that uh, I would suggest that there's a definite problem with uh, the contributions of the diaspora to healthcare in Armenia. And uh, part of that is that there's a lack of a system to identify the specific problems that we can contribute to, suggest resolutions, implement those, and communicate between the different diaspora agencies or people. But I also think that there's a possible solution, and this is just one solution uh, or one way of thinking about things. Um, and that would be to revamp the diaspora's vision towards a project-centric model, so to have a project that we can all contribute to and work to. And why, why should we focus on a project? I think that this is the only way that we can have a meaningful impact in Armenia. It allows us to leverage our resources, ability, political clout, etc., and become an effective stakeholder on the healthcare table in Armenia. Because otherwise, as a fragmented group with small medical societies and small individual, very active people, we're not going to be able to go beyond doing mostly humanitarian work. And I often ask ourselves, when I look back and read old articles about the people who were in the, on the forefront of diaspora and healthcare communities at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and read these articles about how they sat on very dinky Soviet airplanes and did these rather dangerous flights to get their dialysis machines to earthquake survivors in Armenia, that to me is a legacy that they left behind, but I wonder what now our legacy should be, what we should be thinking about so that in 10, 15 years later, people will look back and say, wow, that group of people from that time really left something that is inspirational and did something for the country. So why a project or, or initiative? Again, it allows us to recruit all the people of the diaspora, whether it be healthcare workers, the donors, the charities, public health individuals, other organizations, to work on a project hand in hand with our with our colleagues in Armenia. And essentially, what the other way I like to think about this is that much like the Armenia Fund developed a highway that connected Armenia to Varapov, a project on the healthcare level would be able to develop, a, or in the medical field, to develop a healthcare highway, I think, would be attractive enough so that everybody would have a role within it and also be excited about contributing to. So the idea would be to build a healthcare highway that all of us can work on. This project is not meant to replace existing activities. A lot of people are doing good work in Armenia, and this, this isn't to tell them to stop doing what they're doing and start, you know, come on our boat or, or, or whatnot. Nor is it meant to replace activities of the Republic of Armenia. In fact, all of our efforts should be aimed towards empowering the local infrastructure so that if one day the diaspora is not around, they can survive on their own. Um, I think if we were to design a project, we would have to uh, uh, look and make sure that it involves all the following uh, elements, short-term goals, medium-term objectives, and why not have some dreams about making Armenia a center of medical excellence or whatever dreams that we may have. But I think it's very important that no matter what we set our goals, we also set metrics and ways to evaluate ourselves and make sure that we're on the right course throughout that, uh, throughout that endeavor. I also think it's important to be inclusive and not focus on just one specialty uh, or one field of medicine. 
Um, we should always think about the target population and what the needs are, not do something just because there is a lot of cardiologists in the diaspora, so let's work on cardiology care. We should actually analyze and see what the needs of the target population are, and then focus our interventions towards that. And again, think about the whole entire system, not think about how we can improve or aid one hospital in Armenia. Think about the fact that we as clinicians are only the tip of the iceberg, and healthcare systems don't revolve around clinicians. There's all the entities that we talked about, education, policy, human resources, that we need to contribute to as well if we want to have a chance of improving the healthcare system in Armenia. And of course, throughout all this, we should never compromise ethical principles and do something just because we can while, again, compromising ethical uh, principles. Um, is there precedence for this elsewhere? And there is. Uh, there's an organization called the International Healthcare Pro uh, Partners that actually uh, looks at data and experiences from other low to middle income countries and using an evidence-based approaches approach make recommendations on how any organization, uh, whether it be a charitable foundation like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or I think this would be applicable to us as in diaspora, should do work in a uh, developing country or a low to middle income country. And here are some lessons that they've gathered from, uh, using evidence-based sources uh, for policymakers to um, help design global health interventions. And I think if you think about what we should do as a diaspora as working to together towards a project, many of those lessons would be incorporated in that project. Better coordination of resources can deliver a greater value and better results. It's very intuitive, it seems like it's common sense, but that fits very well into a project-centric model. More can be achieved together than separately. The most pragmatic way to handle fragmentation is to get partners to align behind one sound country-led national health plan. Being more inclusive is more effective, so let's not think about healthcare just amongst us healthcare providers in the diaspora. Let's include other thinkers, other experts, in our, in our uh, uh, endeavor. And for countries to sustain results and become less aid independent, aid must be used to strengthen local institutions. So again, we can't go there and recreate the wheel or try to create institutions without empowering local institutions in Armenia. So all of this is uh, just now starting to come into fruition and the obvious natural next question is, so what is this project that we all should work on and I don't know if I, I don't know, I don't have the answer to that question. I'd be very interested to hear the thoughts of the uh, audience as to what such a project should entail. Some thoughts that we've thought about in uh, making this presentation in the past or in having discussions with people who have experienced or have thought about these ideas uh, are as follows, to potentially develop and maintain, of course, a women's and children's center in Armenia where we would be focusing on improving women's and children's care in Armenia. And this doesn't mean opening up a hospital for women and children in Armenia. This means making or trying to make an impact on policy measures as they uh, um, as they uh, relate to women's and children's care, uh, helping with financing of women's and children's care, etc. Perhaps bringing together and and uh, and uh, developing that institution that uh, Dr. Armenian has talked about and creating a quality and outcome center in Armenia. And a lot of healthcare now, especially in America, is very quality and outcomes driven. Healthcare financing is quality driven and outcomes driven. Uh, just the way all of the hospitals in the healthcare system and institutions are, are set now are completely quality and outcomes uh, driven. Can we do the same in Armenia? Can, we, can our contribution be to improving quality, measuring outcomes and improving outcomes in Armenia? Should we be uh, developing a fellows type program, and I use fellows loosely, in that we would support uh, uh, the best and the brightest in Armenia to advance their own individual medical education, but also afford them the opportunity to do research, to uh, learn about doing other things that are important in healthcare, getting advanced degrees in public health or health administration or health financing, so that we can help develop the leaders of the healthcare system in Armenia. I don't know what the right project is, um, and I don't. I think that the right I, the way to go is to work on a project, but maybe some of you guys would argue against that as well. So um, I guess I'll stop here um, with a bunch of.
questions, uh, many of which I don't have answers to, except for the first one, which is, are we happy with the status quo? And for me, the answer is definitely not. Do we need to change the way the diaspora works? What type of changes are needed? Is this idea of working on a centralized project the way to go for healthcare intervention in Armenia? And if so, what type of project can we agree on? And bringing, it, bringing things back to that four-year-old in Toronto, uh, I think Armen, the healthcare system in Armenia, could definitely use our help. We now have the technology as a diaspora, the resources, the knowledge, and the experience to take care of that patient. And I think we need to do this process called the timeout so that we know what the problems of healthcare of Armenia are. We know who the stakeholders are. We, we develop a plan to treat the patient effectively and we evaluate our work uh, moving, uh, uh, moving ahead into the future. And I do think that if we do these things and we have these discussions, that we will have a healthy healthcare system much like Armin is happy and healthy today in, uh, in uh, Toronto. So uh, thank you very much. I uh, maybe we'll just leave these questions up as discussion points and uh, hopefully start a discussion.